Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last lecture of the Structural Geology 202 course. After discussing different orders of fold in the uh, previous lecture, we uh, will discuss today the formation of parasitic folds, which are higher order folds belonging to a lower order fold. How do such folds form? We see here a uh, competent layer uh, interlayered with uh, less competent layers, and uh, this sequence of layers is undergoing horizontal shortening in the ductile field and uh, this would lead to the formation of symmetric folds as long as folding folding uh, is resulting from layer parallel shortening yeah these folds would be symmetric with uniform fold width and amplitude uh, these would be upright folds with uh, vertical uh, actual surfaces and uh, we find, see here these little regular synclines and anticlines or synforms and antiforms if contraction carries on and uh, gets more intense, then uh, the whole sequence that is here not folded here, it's only the competent layer, this whole sequence might undergo buckling, buckle fold formation uh, as we see it here. And this converts our primarily first order fold, the only fold generation that was formed, uh, into a second order fold. And the uh, whole sequence would form the larger fold and that would be then the new first order fold. When we now see what happens to the limbs, these limbs are getting rotated compared to the original horizontal orientation in this example here. And uh, the shortening direction remains constant. The shortening direction would be horizontal, but now it acts obliquely on these two fold limbs. And uh, this um, would put these limbs under a certain shear stress. We see that the shear stress has a different uh, direction and the shear strain, in fact, that results from this shear stress uh, is, uh, uh, has an orientation that is opposite on each limb. Here we see a top to the right sense of shear and here a top to the left sense of shear on this limb uh, because simply the uh, limbs are differently oriented and uh, the horizontal shortening direction uh, acts differently uh, at a different angle onto these uh, existing, pre-existing, initially symmetric folds. Now this shear stress and the resulting shear strain will change the symmetry of these folds from these uh, upright synforms and antiforms. We will get some uh, sort of verging folds and uh, we get here typical long, short, long limb relationships. The geometry of the long and short limbs uh, is opposite here on either side. Uh, the two different limbs uh, are in principle composed of uh, long short limb fold relationships, but uh, the dragging is just opposite and that causes the opposite, the mirror shape of these uh, folds on the limbs. In the hinge, uh, however, the shortening direction uh, remains the same and also when we just look at this small part of the hinge, the layer is pretty much in the same orientation as we have seen here in the original, in the early state of deformation. And that causes in the hinge symmetric folds uh, of a similar shape like these here. Because of the uh, different geometry, these folds uh, have a terminology that describes the different shape uh, in terms of the uh, a long, short, long limb geometry that is opposite here. The limbs on this side here would uh, be called Z folds. Uh, the symmetric ones in the hinge are MW folds because of their symmetric shape. And on this limb here, uh, the uh, short, long limb relationship is just opposite, is mirrored, mirrored compared to the uh, opposite limb here. And that is uh, the limb where we would form S folds. Let's have a look. Uh, at a rotated version of exactly this uh, image B here. Here we can see that better, that we see here this typical Z shape that is the feature that gave these types of folds their name. Uh, on the opposite limb here we see the S shape of these folds and in the hinge the MW shape. Uh, during the lecture, and you might have copied the uh, graphics from the whiteboard, I have uh, presented a somewhat better uh, graphic where we can see the Z and S shape uh, 
more clearly and also the M shape in the hinge. It is important that uh, we can identify these two limbs and specifically the position of the hinge zone using the geometry of folds uh, as a symmetric type of folds for those in the hinge and asymmetric ones on, for those on the limbs because sometimes in the field it is by no means clear whether a position, an outcrop, is located in a fold hinge or on the fold limbs. Here we see a another sketch from another textbook that illustrates the Z and the S shape of such shear folds, uh, parasitic folds that have formed on folds, fold limbs. Uh, placing them in slightly different orientation from the long, short, long limb relationship of uh, the S shape in this case here and the Z shape with the long, short, long limb relationship we can see uh, that uh, even if we only have this isolated information, we would complete the uh, closure of the fold in this fashion, not in any fashion that would connect these two sides, these two ends of the limbs. This uh, can be a very helpful uh, piece of information if uh, we have inc incomplete structural record in the field and we need to reconstruct missing parts of the folds. Here we see from a different textbook, uh, Hatcher's textbook in chapter 14, uh, another example of the S and Z shape now in a recumbent fold, uh, similar to the one that we have just seen before. Again here, the S geometry of the limb correlates with the shear strain on this limb, and uh, the Z shape on the other limb correlates with the opposite shear strain that we see here on the opposite limb. In the hinge zone, we see more symmetrical folds as we see them here, MW folds in the hinge. And also this sketch here illustrates a shortening direction that obliquely acts on a fold limb and that drags and shears the pre-existing folds. And uh, this brings them into this asymmetric uh, either S or Z shape geometry, depending on the limb that we are observing. Here in this list, uh, again, the characteristics of parasitic folds and uh, folds of different orders. We have been uh, seeing this in uh, illustrations before, and we have mentioned that in the last lecture, that the hinge lines of parasitic folds are parallel uh, to those of higher or lower order folds. That uh, means if we have this genetic relationship that folds are forming during uh, the same time at different scale and different size, the hinge lines should be roughly parallel. Also, the actual surfaces should be parallel as far as the strike is concerned uh, across uh, different orders of fold. The dip direction and the dip, di dip angle might vary. The advantage of this self-similarity of folds at a different scale helps us if we cannot see the whole fold structure at a larger scale, but we can at upcrop scale perhaps uh, observe a third or fourth order fold generation that uh, helps us to make some uh, reasonable and probably very reliable assumptions on the geometry of the larger scale fold that cannot be mapped or can only be mapped uh, after a longer mapping exercise at, uh, in a large area at larger scale. The asymmetry of parasitic folds can be used for tectonic analysis and uh, how that goes we will see on the next uh, few slides. Here, for instance, we see an area, a surface area in a certain uh, terrain where a geologist has mapped a, a uniformly dipping sequence of layers. And these layers here, they belong to folds. That might be known from uh, the regional context, or smaller folds might have been seen in the, in the field. And within these layers, we see uh, parasitic folds being developed. Here we see one a type of parasitic folds, which would be a Z-shaped fold here, another set of Z-shaped folds. Here's an, here are S-shaped folds. And uh, from these geometric relationships, we will be able to reconstruct the, uh, the uh, overall fold structure, and we will be able to see how these layers might be connected via synform and antiformal hinges. So here we have now mapped the uh, layers that show a Z-geometry, and uh, here are the S 
parasitic folds uh, in these two layers in the, in the center. And this allows us now to, to connect uh, the correct layers with each other. Uh, here we see the result. Here we see that these uh, Z-shaped layers, these belong to the upright limb, to the normal limb of a fold, if this is a sedimentary, sedimentary sequence. And the um, right way up, the uh, sedimentary way up, would be in this direction that we see here. This is our upright limb. The hinge must be positioned in this direction and uh, here the overturned limb, these layers with the S-shaped parasitic folds. That is where the overturned limb would uh, turn down back into the ground again. And uh, here I must reconnect via a synclinal or synformal fold closure to these Z-shaped um, layers with these Z-shaped uh, parasitic folds. Uh, such reconstructions are very important if we uh, want to develop the tectonic style of, a, of an area and then this might have reasons for mineral exploration and we have seen in the uh, last lectures that uh, fold closures for instance can be the sites of uh, mineralizations that uh, you might want to drill and if you uh, know how the fold structure actually would look like underground, uh, you would be able to drill this core of the fold and you would not try to find a core of a fold, for instance, here. You also know that this fold uh, hinge, this fold hinge, has been eroded and uh, we can, cannot mine it anymore, but uh, probably with uh, some uh, good uh, further mapping we might find uh, synclinal fold closures uh, hinges over here, and the next anticlinal hinge would be somewhere over here. This is important because uh, you always want to minimize the uh, drill meters that you have to um, put down into the ground uh, during mineral exploration, and uh, because this is very expensive. And if structural analysis can help to minimize uh, drilling costs, uh, this is uh, very valuable for exploration campaigns. If these are sedimentary structures, and uh, we see here the normal layering, uh, we can identify using the, the symmetry, the asymmetry of parasitic folds to identify normal layering and overturned layering in such a sequence. Further fold analysis is uh, possible if we use uh, the relative orientation of layering, for instance sedimentary bedding that has undergone folding, and the associated uh, cleavage, because during folding we very often would form actual plane cleavage. Now, like in this example here, this is an example of a sequence of uh, less competent and more competent layers, for instance shales and quartzites are interlayered here, and uh, we clearly see here an overturned fold. From the surface uh, outcrop, from the information that we would uh, collect as a mapping geologist, this cross-section is by no means evident uh, to everyone who just uh, does some survey ma mapping over here. But uh, utilizing the relative relationship and the geometric relationship between cleavage and uh, layering, we can work out the fold structure uh, much more precisely. Uh, here, for instance, we should note that uh, there is a certain fanning out of the uh, cleavage of uh, the cleavage in the more competent layers, whereas in the less competent layers, the cleavage is essentially uh, parallel to the actual surface that we see here. This fanning that we see here, the deviation of the direction uh, from the direction of the actual surface is a feature of rock component competence. Harder rocks like these quartzites, for instance, uh, will tend to develop a cleavage that goes more directly, uh, trying to go to, through the shortest way uh, across such a competent layer. And uh, that means uh, it is not going parallel to the actual surface, because that would be a very long way through these hard rocks. Instead, we get this uh, cleavage refra re refraction that shows us a bit of a shorter way through these hard layers. We also see that the spacing of the cleavage in more competent rocks uh, is much larger, 
than in less competent phyllosilicate rich, uh, rich rocks like, like the shales. On the overturned limb, we see the cleavage refraction happening in the uh, opposite direction. We see this here on this side. Cleaver, cleavage refraction again uh, occurs away from uh, the actual surface and into a direction that is uh, more perpendicular to the layer boundaries. Obviously not entirely perpendicular here on these limbs, um, but uh, what we see here in the hinge zone, indeed we have a cleavage orientation that is perpendicular to the layer boundaries, and that applies to competent, competent and less competent layers. This is a valuable piece of information because if you are in, uh, say, green schist facets rocks like in the Cape Fold Belt, where you find interlayering of shales, shales and quartzites very commonly, you uh, can rely on this relationship. And if you find an area that might be poorly exposed and you do not see the overall structure immediately because uh, that might be a, to a large scale, you uh, will find here areas where the cleavage is perpendicular to the layer boundaries. And then you know you are mapping a fold hinge at this time. If you find the situation that you have cleavage refraction and you have oblique orientation between cleavage and layer boundaries, so not 90 degrees, then you know you are on either of these fold limbs, and also that is important. You can even go further with uh, the interpretation because uh, when you look at uh, carefully at the relative dip angle of bound layer boundaries of sedimentary layers, for instance, lithological layers, and the dip angle of the cleavage that uh, might be refracted in the, um, in the more competent layers. You find that on the normal limb, the upper limb here of this fold, where uh, the uh, way up, the sedimentary way up, is also the uh, way up that you would see in the field, on this normal limb, cleavage is steeper than the layer. In contrast, when we go to the overturned limb here, in such a overturned in a verging fold, we see that here the layering is steeper than the foliation. And also this is a piece of information that you might find in an isolated small outcrop somewhere in the field. This will instantly tell you that uh, this here is the overturned limb, this is uh, the layering, where the layering is steeper than the more shallowly dipping cleavage. And as I said in the uh, fold hinge, in the hinge zone, cleavage is perpendicular to the layering. All this allows reconstruction of the fold geometry and the uh, fold shape uh, from isolated bits of a surface outcrop uh, that uh, is not providing the, the context as we would see it here in the, in the cross section. All this information can be gathered at the surface. It, for instance, would uh, tell you that uh, from this layer here, this layer will never continue into such an anticlinal fold. The fold closure, the fold uh, hinge, must go in this direction, because here we are on the upright limb, on the normal limb, here we are on the overturned limb. Again, here, uh, the geometry uh, between cleavage and layer orientation forces us to interpret the fold hinge in such a manner, as we see it here on the diagram. Uh, such a uh, fold hinge is not possible with this geometric relationship. We, uh, let's review the uh, cleavage refraction a li little bit closer. Here we have a close-up of uh, the diagram we just have seen. Here we see the cleavage refraction very nicely. In the less competent layer, the cleavage is parallel to the uh, actual surface. In the more competent layer, we refract the cleavage into a direction that is a bit closer to an orientation perpendicular to the layer boundaries. Uh, we also see this effect down here from the orientation of the actual cleavage into a, a refracted orientation in competent layers. Not so in the hinge of the fold. Uh, here the uh, perpendicular orientation between uh, the cleavage and the layer boundaries. That is also 
the short, already the uh, shortest possible way through such competent layers. And here we do not see cleavage refraction. The cleavage goes through all layers regardless of competence. And this again is a piece of evidence that we easily can find in, uh, in outcrops in, in the field. So cleavage refraction is an important uh, term and cleavage refraction is restricted essentially to uh, upper crustal rocks to rocks that have not seen very high temperatures of metamorphism because a high temperature will reduce the competence contrast between such layers. We will talk about that in the third year course in more detail. But uh, in high-grade metamorphic rocks, uh, a quartzite would be more or less as soft as a shale, which then probably would be a, uh, a nice or uh, perhaps a mica schist. So the competence contrast between different lithologies will uh, decrease with increasing temperature of metamorphism. And uh, this cleavage refraction requires some competence contrast. And uh, this is strongest perhaps in uh, the upper green schist facies or lower amphibolite facies. Now let's talk about polyphase folding, folding and fold interference uh, that requires uh, two generations of uh, folding. Uh, one fold generation overprints the other and uh, we will see that this can result to in very complex interference patterns. Let's start with a fairly simple case. Now we have here two fold generations. Um, a first fold geometry that we see here, an upright fold with a vertical axial surface, and uh, well, probably an open interlimb angle and a horizontal, a horizontal hinge line. This first deformation, this first folding event, is overprinted by a second folding event, and this second folding event is very similar in geometry. Also, here we have an upright fold, and we have a horizontal hinge line and uh, a similar kind of uh, shortening, which uh, leads to a, uh, you know, probably also 90 degrees interlimb angle, something in this ballpark. However, if such a folding event overprints such a folding event, we will intensify, we will inten intensify the uh, folding and this will result in a higher amplitude and a smaller interlimb angle because we carry on shortening in the same fashion as the first uh, folding event. Such overprints uh, which are uh, entirely uh, parallel, where uh, just a pre-existing fold gets further tightened, these are very difficult to identify as two separate events and uh, you probably would uh, have to do a lot of uh, research on uh, detail in detail, uh, perhaps using thin sections trying to identify different deformation temperatures. Uh, of these two folding event, events in order to identify them in the first place. More obvious uh, is uh, polyphase folding when uh, the fold geometry of the first uh, folding event is not the same like the second folding event here. We see such an example. We see now here the first folding event and the second folding event. They have uh, perpendicular actual, actual surfaces and hinge lines. Um, both in this case would be upright folds that form and that interfere with each other and if uh, this is the older uh, folding event and this is the second one, the resulting fold geometry would be something that we call dome and basin structure and we see this is a much more complex, complicated uh, fold geometry. Uh, still this would be a relatively simple situation because we have here a high angle between the uh, two hinge lines and the to actual surfaces of the first and second fold generation. Here we see an example where such dome and basin structures exist. This comes from the uh, Northern Cape uh, near the Onsepkans area. And uh, have a look here at the light and dark blue layers. Uh, these are uh, different types of migmatitic and granitic rocks. And uh, the light the light blue one is uh, underlying the uh, dark blue uh, rock and, uh, and here we can see there are two fold generations that have resulted in domes and here in a large basin in this basin structure we also see this uh, granite involved that is uh, 
shown in red color. Now here we see the satellite image of this region. Here is this large basin and the dome structures are not as easy to see. They are here outlined as ring structures. Darker material, the darker material corresponds to the dark blue uh, color here on the geological map. Uh, the domes here, they are eroded, so the uh, top of the dome is uh, simply chopped off and we can uh, therefore see this ring-like structure that is characteristic for domes uh, that have uh, eroded um, upper parts. So clearly we have here in this area two fold generations and uh, they must have acted uh, at high angles with uh, to each other and uh, this requires two different shortening directions in order to form these large scale dome and basin structures. More interference patterns. Here now it's getting a little bit more complicated. We have here a recumbent uh, fold with a horizontal or near horizontal axial surface and a hinge line that is perpendicular to the second folding event. And uh, also here we have a different orientation of the axial surface. This is an upright fold with a vertical axial surface. And if uh, such two fold generations uh, uh, would interfere with each other, we are getting a very complicated interference pattern that we see outlined here. Uh, to unravel something like that in the field is not easy, but uh, what you would try to do is uh, to find areas where no fold interference exists and where we can uh, see the first and the second fold uh, generation separately without interference. And that helps us reconstructing the uh, origin of such complex interference patterns. Type 3 here is the uh, actual surface again perpendicular, but the hinge lines are parallel to each other. One of these um, folds would be recumbent this year, the other one upright, and the interference uh, of these two folds is less complex because the hinge lines are parallel to each other. Uh, we see here the refolding of older folds, and uh, this is a pattern that you quite often can see in the field. Uh, we call this coaxial folding. Uh, here, dome and basin structure again. It's not so simple as we have seen it before. Here is the coaxial refolding along hinges that are parallel to each other. But as we have seen, <coughs> but as, as we have seen with different or differently oriented axial surfaces. Here we see such an example, a coaxial refolding of uh, an F1, a first isoclinal intrafolial fold. Now this would be these here. Intrafolial folds uh, are typically isoclinal folds here, which are developed in specific layers in the rock. Now we're going to see that in uh, more detail in the next course. Uh, here we also see some chaotic interference patterns of different fold generations in the core of the fold. Clearly we can see that the older fold here, this isoclinal one, was refolded around this hinge line that uh, we are looking at. Here we see block diagrams of different fold interference patterns and I don't want to discuss all of them in, uh, in detail. But uh, here we have seen these patterns again on the geological map. Uh, this is a typical outcrop pattern that you might see when you look onto dome and basin structures. The domes would be in here, the basins in between, and uh, you can see if you have a different view on such uh, fold geometries from the side, you will see here on the top one fold generation, generation and here on the other side of the block you see the other fold, fold generation. Also these examples here are interference patterns with uh, slightly obliquely intersecting uh, folds. Uh, but again, these are outcrop patterns of dome and basin structures. Coaxial folding is shown, shown here on this side. Uh, here the hinge lines are parallel. Uh, more complex interference patterns are seen down here at the bottom. And uh, when you see something that in the field, it will take you a while to unravel what is going on. But it's helping a lot to look uh, in 3D space from different directions onto these folds. You might actually get some clue. Um, but uh, certainly this is not 
a very quick piece of work. This uh, requires probably quite a long time in the field to understand what's going on. Interaction of folding and faulting uh, is also something that we have uh, touched in this course a couple of times, specifically in the context of the uh, brittle ductile transition where we can have brittle features, faults, and ductile features folding uh, happening at the same time. This requires certain temperature ranges and uh, certain rock types and uh, of course uh, layered rocks like uh, this sequence of quartzites uh, that we see here from the Marinsport area and uh, some, of, oh, some of you in uh, the honors class might actually um, go there and uh, have a look at these rocks. What we are looking at here is uh, what we call flat ramp structures. Uh, Davis and Reynolds, Chapter 8, uh, speaks about that in more detail, but let's have a look. Where is the ramp? Where is the flat? Obviously here, at the bottom of these folds, we see, we see a, a tectonic contact. That would be a fault zone, a brittle uh, or semi-brittle uh, shear zone, fault zone. That consists of flat-lying fault uh, seg segments and then inclined fold segments and again here behind this tree we are not seeing that on the photograph very very well uh, would follow another flat lying fold surface and uh, what we see here is a kind of a thrusting event from uh, the right hand side to the left hand side which in the area would be uh, from south to north and uh, the arrows indicate here this sense of shear when such a layered sequence uh, like these quartzites here are forced to move up such a ramp, uh, they, the resulting geometry in the areas that respond by ductile failure would be the development of these folds that we see here. In Davis and Reynolds, uh, the fold ge geometry is uh, shown. It is here just the other way around. We have here a flat ramp structure with uh, top to the right hand side displacement and uh, what we are seeing here are various uh, structures uh, like the trailing anticline, anticlines and synclines. Let's just reduce the number of terms to the essential one. Um, ones. These are the ones that are typically used in the description of such flat ramp structures or association of uh, brittle failure and ductile failure. We see here uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the transition of the uh, lower flat to the ramp, uh, the trailing syncline. Here it's a synclinal fold, which can be a kind of a chevron fold, a kink-like fold that we see here in the, uh, in the schematic sketch, but uh, it also can be a more ductile fold, which has a more roundish uh, hinge and not a sharp kink as seen here. Then here at the upper end of the ramp, we would form the trailing anticline, uh, which uh, then brings our, our, uh, our tilted uh, layers again into horizontal direction. And uh, here in front, uh, we might form a leading anticline and a leading syncline. Cline that is formed from uh, further or by further displacement into this direction. Uh, we might have a look at the um, mirrored geometry and again we see here now a top to the left uh, flat ramp structure with the flat the ramp the trailing syncline the trailing anticline and the uh, leading anticline and the leading syncline let's see how that matches our example from mirroring sport it uh, is almost a perfect match let's have a look here we have the leading syncline here is the leading anticline, the trailing anticline, and the trailing syncline. They are all there. And of course, the flat and the ramp and the upper flat fold. All that in a top to the north, or top to the left sense of shear in this example. Here we see a sequence of sketches how such a flat ramp structure develops uh, in the uh, stages. Uh, we see here at the beginning of uh, the cross-cutting of layer parallel folds which cross-cut uh, 
typically at 30 degrees as you know, cross cut layers and then continue again layer parallel. Now here we start at the beginning of displacement uh, forming these kink-like or also more ductile folds uh, which later become uh, the uh, trailing anticlines and the uh, um, leading anticlines and uh, with increasing strain and displacement when uh, the upper layer block or this sequence here uh, moves further and further up the ramp we see that the folds are developing to more pronounced structures and uh, here we see the resulting um, geometry that we just have been discussing with uh, trailing syn and anticlines and leading syn and anticlines and with a well-developed uh, flat ramp structures at the bottom of these folds. Here we see another structure that I don't want to discuss in detail. This is an early stage of uh, such a flat ramp structure in uh, development and uh, this is what we call here a blind thrust fold. This is a thrust fold that just ends here uh, at this area where kink folds uh, actually then uh, carry on with uh, with uh, accommodating the strain. So this is something that has stopped at this uh, at this stage. But blind thrusts are actually quite common in nature. The difference is uh, simply that the upper flat is missing in this example. Here are other um, faults, uh, fault-fold interactions. Um, one type that we see here are so-called imbricate fans or duplex structures. They are fairly similar to flat ramp structures. Uh, there are some differences and uh, let's briefly discuss them. Imbricate fans here, they typically show these curved triangular thrust slices that we see here and uh, they are these uh, blind thrusts that we see here they are merging into a uh, single sole thrust and uh, strain is accommodated here by thrusting uh, up to the end of the blind thrust and uh, during this displacement these triangular sharp folds chevron type folds uh, will uh, fall and uh, they are separated by these uh, steepening ramps that uh, eventually become uh, so steep that they cannot be uh, activated any further uh, in a stress field or in a strain field that is indicated here by the arrow. So as soon as this angle here is getting too steep, we will not manage to uh, achieve any displacement on these steep ends of these blind thrusts. Yeah, here yeah, are they labeled again. These are the blind thrusts that uh, steepen up and become inactive because their angle with the stress field uh, becomes uh, so large that uh, displacement is no longer possible. Duplex structures. Duplex structures are uh, also very common in areas like the cave fold belt and fold and thrust belts. What we see here is a, a decalment of thrust slices, uh, which we call horses, along an incompetent weak layer. And uh, here we see the uh, transport along such a bottom thrust that uh, goes here, layer parallel initially, and then uh, it breaks through at usually 30 degrees, uh, that is the typical angle, uh, as a thrust to a higher layer where then continues as a flat structure. This is very similar to the flat ramp structures. Uh, what is different uh, that we also have here in the hanging wall of this whole structure, a, uh, a thrust, a covering uh, thrust layer and um, uh, this upper thrust sheet is, uh, is one of these uh, uh, important parts of a duplex structure. In addition, we see here that these individual horses, as we call them, are bound on all sides by tectonic contacts. Here is a, the upper thrust, here is the uh, lower one, and also in between the horses there are these ramp structures that uh, are tectonic uh, surfaces. Here we see how duplex structures develop over time.
at the beginning we might have here this uh, upper glide horizon, a flat ram structure, uh, without the modifying uh, details uh, shown here. They might exist uh, or they might not exist. So we, we have here a major thrust sheet that uh, runs up this ramp and then uh, continues layer parallel. And uh, here we see that uh, at a certain stage this ramp might become locked. No strain hardening, any other process that stops displacement along the ramp. And what would happen next is that this uh, bottom uh, fault just continues layer parallel until it finds a point where a ramp can cut through uh, this, uh, these layers here at the bottom. And uh, then this ramp would be activated and we see here that uh, we now form a horse. This horse overrides uh, its own foreland and uh, again might become locked, might become stuck. The uh, process uh, repeats itself with a continuation along the bottom thrust that we see here, the layer parallel fold, uh, until it finds an opportunity to cut across as a ramp. Uh, and this again would be a situation where we would have probably the dip angle of 30 degrees that we have been discussing uh, pretty much the whole course. And this uh, process then can repeat itself until more and more horses are uh, formed and uh, this way the duplex structure propagates forward onto its own foreland, onto uh, the continuation of this layer that is uh, repeatedly cross-cut by new rams as soon as an old ramp gets stuck and locked. Uh, this is um, from a uh, Wikipedia entry on faults, and uh, this uh, section on faults in Wikipedia is uh, certainly very nice. You should actually have a look at it. Uh, this also shows us in uh, sequence sketches the development of duplex structures. You might look at this here, and here it develops further and further with uh, more and more RAMs developing uh, once other ramps are getting locked. Here you see this one is active at this time, becomes inactive here, a new one develops. This is the future one uh, that is active here at this stage. And here you are uh, piling up horses one on top of the other and all that is overlaid by a roof thrust. This is a duplex structure. One short comment on sheath folds. Uh, this is uh, again something that uh, involves thrusting and folding. Um, you could say this is a kind of an equivalent of duplex structures in more ductile regimes. Uh, here we do not have any brittle failure. This is an entirely ductile structure. And um, uh, here we have layer parallel shearing with locally larger displacement. That means at a certain stage we start, well, we could say crumbling up such a layer and such a fold starts to form. And if strain is high enough uh, and specifically localized um, high strains, they can pull such a kind of a fold with a strongly curving hinge line uh, parallel to the transport direction. And uh, this is something that we see in, uh, you know, upper amphibolite facies quite commonly. When you would uh, erode and cut through such uh, through such uh, the front of such a fold, sheath fold, you would get such concentric layers. Um, this is, uh, some people call, call them in fact condom folds. Uh, you can think about why. Cone-shaped folds with strongly curving hinge lines. They are non-cylindrical because the hinge line is strongly curving not like the folds we have been discussing before where the hinge line is straight. These are non-cylindrical folds and uh, high strain uh, may destroy actually the sheath folds. If you shear and shear and shear you flatten them out and uh, you will see nothing of the sheath, fo sheath fold uh, in uh, finite uh, very high strain at the end of a long-lasting deformation process. Uh, you can check out this YouTube uh, video um, and you will learn a little bit more about sheath folds. I believe this is the end of the course. Uh, thank you very much and uh, we see each other again in third year.
for more tactile failure and for more te tectonic processes. Thank you very much.